So hydration. Concrete gets hard because of a chemical process called hydration. It's not a physical, it's not evaporation up in the air. It is literally a chemical process where the chemicals, that the chemical composition of cement react with the water and it in turn eventually starts the hardening process of concrete and over time it'll continue to harden. So if you see the the picture I have down there, there's three little cement, little round little cement particles in water, so in water solution. Over time, they'll start reacting around the surface of those particles and they'll start producing um, you know, compounds, hydration products is what people call them. So there'll be different products that are actually most of the time attached. There may be some in the solution, but most of the time they're actually around the cement particle. And the goal is how you get initial set is actually whenever those different particles actually interconnect together and it starts to actually stiffen up slightly. And then over time, it'll get to final set where the concrete actually gets hard enough where you can eventually walk on. So it's important to kind of realize that when you look at, if you take a slice of concrete and you look at it under a microscope, it actually looks like a hardened sponge. So there's little voids in it here and there. It's because those hydration, those little voids are actually from water um, that's actually you know gone out of the mix, gone out of the concrete. Um, and the pores a lot of times is also from the interconnectivity. So you see the little blue little spots over there. Eventually that will create a, a hole. So the water will eventually disappear. So your goal is you want those particles close together so that they provide a good reactivity and they provide a lot better strength. That's why the water cement ratio of concrete is really important. The more water you have and less cement you have, the farther those particles go farther apart. So you dilute your mix, kind of like I talked about painting um, a fence and you whitewash it, the same principle. So you're moving those particles farther and farther apart. So those hydration products, how they interconnect, it's gonna take longer for them to interconnect. And those bonds won't be as strong. So when we talk about the different major chemical compounds, I'm not expecting you to necessarily memorize these, but uh, I do have a uh, problem on your homework where you actually have to identify uh, the major compounds of hydrated and unhydrated cement. And they'll be pretty, you know, pretty basic, but you could take a flash part and at least, you know, uh, kind of flash through it, kind of be familiar. Um, with the C3S, C2S, C3A, um, and then the ferrite and gypsum. Those are, you know, the, the basic compounds. And each of those compounds play a role in how the, the concrete's going to perform. The ferrite is probably the only one that doesn't play a huge role, and that's because uh, the iron, a very small amount of iron that's actually in this Portland cement, you use it as a flux. So um, in the actual uh, cement kiln, there's a gigantic fire that makes the limestone turn into uh, volcanic lava. And so you need a little bit of iron um, in that flux, so a little bit of iron in there. And so that actually creates more of a gray color. So if you use white cements, that actually has a very low amount of ferrite. So they do other things to to be able to produce, you know, the cement still, uh, just not not the color. Um, they make it white as opposed to gray. Gypsum again helps control flash set, so that C3A doesn't just shoot off. It's kind of the crazy, the, the crazy uncle in the family. 
So the gypsum's there to kind of control it. Um, but it does do a really great job with initial set, um, a lot of accelerators and retarders. Uh, their chemical admixtures, and they actually uh, control either the CPA for initial set or this A line up here actually um, controls some of your initial set too. So some admixtures focus more on the CPA or the CPS, depending on their chemical makeup. So they'll play with either one of those, and, and both of those um, affect your early extremes and your seven times. So if, you're, if that just scared you, just kind of take a seat. And remember, concrete is kind of like a rocket, okay? But when it shoots off and it starts getting hard, it starts reacting, that cement and water start reacting together. Kind of like a rocket ship. There's different stages. I told you this before. You may see something exactly like this on your test. And the goal is when you talk about strengths over time, so you can whether it's compressive strength versus time, or I can even talk about reactivity over time. Um, but most people focus on strength because that's the performance you get paid on. How the strength goes and, and makes it depends on your different stages. So your C3A um, is kind of what it shoots off at first. Then your C3S can shoot off about the same time or maybe even a little after. Then you have your cementitious, so like a class C fly ash or slag will actually start reacting a little bit too. And then what will contribute to your strengths farther along is the C2S and the pozzolon properties. So B light, which is another name for C2S, and then the pozzolon, so like a class F fly ash, will react and um, over time, so at 56 days or 90 days, you will see a little bit more strength gain. So once the cement and the water start reacting, those different comp uh, chemical compositions, they will actually produce um, hydration products. So, you know, like I talked about the, the C2S, C3S, the C3A, they will react with water and then they will produce these. So the etronite, that's actually from largely from your C3A, and it forms your, what, your initial set, helps to reduce that pore structure initially. The C3, uh, CSH is from your C3S, and that's gonna provide you the majority of your strength. It's kind of like the glue. The, C, uh, the calcium hydroxide, the CH, that's going to provide you with um, the pH. It's kind of like the human shield. So the pH of concrete is about 12 and a half to 13. And it's because you're, you're calcium hydroxide, the CH. So if any of you have ever um, tore out uh, concrete before and you had like a piece of rebar, you saw that little it's like the white powder around your rebar, you know what I'm talking about. Um, even, you know, even in the lab, if you go in the lab and there's some white powder um, from concrete being dried, that's actually calcium hydroxide. So it has a really high pH. So it prevents rebar from rusting. Um, so that's why if you see rebar that's already slightly rusted, um, you can actually still put it in concrete. It's not that big of a deal because that uh, that C, uh, the calcium hydroxide, the CH, will actually stop it from reacting anymore. Um, we can go down another rabbit trail about uh, plexi cutter rebar and, 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 and corrosion on a different day. But um, and then AFM, people are still kind of learning about. It's uh, a lot smaller 
of a compound, but it does have some issues with sulfate attack. But it, it does give a little bit of strength and a little, and it does reduce your pores. So you reduce those pores, those stagnant air voids, and your concrete gets stronger. So there's different hydration products. When do they react? Etronite. Well, you take just pure etronite, and you watch it react over time. Um, etronite will kick off pretty quickly. But within like you know just a few days it's done. The CSH kicks off really well too, and the, and the CH they all kind of kick off really quickly. Um, and really the etronite and the CSH they're the ones that are going to provide you your strengths. So, like I've talked about already. The cement and the water, they actually produce heat. It's an exothermic reaction, meaning heat is being released. If you go out in the middle of, a, if you ever finish a floor slab, middle of summer, you go out in the middle and you're actually uh, uh, finishing that floor slab, you can feel that heat bounce off that concrete. And you feel those waves. You can, it's like almost like you can see them and, and, and it almost burns you. And a lot of that is actually a release of the heat. Um, you can feel it. So there's five different stages. You need to know there's five different stages of, uh, of hydration. Okay. I'll show you a chart that will be on your test, will be on your homework. You need to know it. So there's five different stages. Stage one. Whenever, right, whenever the water and the, the cement are just mixed, they're at the batch plant and they're mixing. Stage two, so there's, if you see, there's that little bitty red kick that goes up. So there's just, it's very, very minor. It's like, it takes just a couple seconds. Then all of a sudden, that cement and the water, there's a barrier that goes around that cement particle that doesn't want to react at all. So you have this dormant stage where you can go and you can take that ready mix truck and you can drive to the job site and you can place your concrete, get everything looking great, hopefully, and then an initial set will occur where those cement particles and the water start reacting and start forming um, or start actually reacting around the surface. The little green part is actually etronite. A little squiggly stuff. That's actually what Mr. Uh, it, uh, it. It's actually a little um, CSH and a little a little uh, um, yellow diamonds here. They're actually CH. So they all react. Eventually, they all interconnect with each other. Um, during stage four, and then stage five, they actually just start thinking where you know initial step it starts the hardening process where these compounds you know start actually touching each other and then final set they're actually getting hard enough the products are actually touching each other enough where it actually becomes hard and then around here you can actually walk on and saw and stuff um, so that's actually what's happening so this chart I will ask you on your homeworks about. This chart is provided in your course material. It will say a hydration poster. But I'm gonna ask you, what is this stage? Mixing stage, what is stage two? The dormancy, meaning there's dormant, meaning nothing's reacting. What is stage three? That's the hardening, go from the initial set, Roughly your final set. It's actually the hardening process stage. Your stage four is really when their things start cooling down. Stop, start, stops reacting as hard. There's not as much water. A lot of the water is already reacted here. That's why a lot of times you want to go and cure the concrete when it adds more water after after it gets to the hardening stage, so that you can um, keep that hydration process up. And then over time, this may be three, six weeks later, 
um, is the densification process. And how far this goes down depends on how much water you have in your system and how much things are curing and how many cement particles haven't actually reacted yet. Where's sawing? So concrete, you go out there, you look on the sidewalk and you're walking into the little line. So there's little joints. So the concrete in general, it cracks because of grind shrinkage. And so what you do to control cracking is you actually put saw joints um, in the, the sidewalk, a lot of different places in the concrete. And so this is just about the sawing window. So that'll be like exam three. We'll talk up a lot about that. So just kind of be aware, concrete, it will, it likes to be in squares. So normally you go out, so you have a, a sidewalk here or a pad. You see how it's kind of a, or a, a rectangle. Well, you may have something that looks like this, a little wide. It might crack like that. Well, if that found over time, you may just get a little crack here in the middle, too. So if you put a little saw joint there, you control that cracking by cutting the by cutting the uh, a joint in there that looks real pretty, or prettier than my third grade. You can actually control it from having a little wide crack or just cracking kind of in the middle. So you, you can actually take a saw that's made for concrete, not wood. You can, you can saw a line in there. And it looks pretty. It's like a controlled crack. So if you're anything like me and you talk about this hydration process, I kind of scratch my head a little bit. You start thinking about how hydration and construction and how important it is. We have your initial, you know, your rate of heat that's being released over time. And how, yeah, you need this, you need to be able to place the replacement window. You need to be able to place your concrete before initial set occurs. Because once initial set occurs, you won't be able to place that concrete very easily. It'll start stiffening up. You're going to have all sorts of problems, you know, so it won't be as flowable as you want. Um, so you need to get everything placed before that initial set. And then you can start finishing. So you have a finishing window here. So depending on how stiff that concrete is and what application depends on what type of finishing you do. And that duration of that finishing window is, is really key. And you can use accelerators and retarders to help control that finishing window, among other things. And we'll talk more in, in hot and cold weather concrete um, about that. So that's more like exam three. And then eventually you get the final set um, where you can't finish the top of it anymore. Uh, you can actually start walking on it. Um, and everything so and not leave any footprints and you can actually take a nail and and, and and scratch in the concrete and you may not even leave a mark so this is just another another um, kind of how the steps are divided out if you're looking at construction all right so Is that with the finishing? Is that the thing that they walk around with a little pad that goes in circular motion on top of it, like a concrete pad? Or yeah. So I'll talk about that coming up um, in a different lecture. But yeah, that's uh, what you're describing is a um, a trowel machine, and so that's for for floor slabs. Is what you'll use that for? But yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in a different. Um, I thought I had a different, uh, here it is. All right, so this is a poster. 
stages of hydration. So you can go through and look at each of those five individual stages. Again, this is where I took the picture at in the um, from the PowerPoint. And there's different stages here. So you can actually look at how SCMs kind of affect these different stages, how chemical admixtures affect these stages. You can also talk about incompatibility. So um, with all the materials, when they come together, sometimes they can have some problems. Um, we'll talk about that. And um, that's kind of exam four material where we actually talk about troubleshooting concrete. Um, so there's a lot of information. This kind of is another good illustration on how particles, as you can see, going from the um, very far left there, as it, that cement particle starts getting in the water and it starts reacting, and over time that particle starts becoming smaller because those products are reacting around the surface. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, well, what I would say is every secondary cementitious material, so if you use fly ash, if you use a slag or silica fume, they all act a little differently, they all react a little differently. Um, the class F fly ash is a pozzolan, so it's not, you know, these first stages here, if you're not going to see much, but this densification stage, you're going to see it actually start reacting um, because of because of the pozzolanic properties it has. You'll actually start seeing the CSH and or in the calcium, the calcium sorry the calcium the CH in that um, silica will actually start reacting and produce more CSH. And I talked about that on Monday. Um, class C, well, actually, you'll, you can actually see some of it react here because um, it has more of a cementitious properties. It has more calcium in it, so it'll start reacting there. So it's kind of cool to, to see some of that. Um, but this is a great poster. Like I said, it will be... Hydration poster. You have your PCA design and control book, which is a really good book. Um, I'd also highly suggest looking at this book that I gave you, IMCP, and just go through it. Just look at it. It has a lot of great illustrations about the stuff we're talking about. Okay. All right. So on the homeworks, I'm going to give you a picture that looks like that. And I'm going to ask you what these five stages are. So it will be a question that says, what's stage one? What's stage two? What's stage three? You know, so there will be five different questions. Each of them will ask a different stage. Um, you'll have multiple choice. So um, realize that. And... So talked about this. I want to talk about it again because I want to make sure people understand it. So if you have a normal hydration curve, you can have a slower setting one, meaning meaning this little area here is extended. You can also have things like double humps, which will indicate that you, you know, that for some reason the cement stopped reacting right here or, stopped, or started slowing down. So that might indicate that you're going to have strength issues, incompatibility issues. You know, I messed up this a little bit, but a fast set, meaning instead of having a normal set, that line is going to get pushed. So this one right here is going to be smaller. So you have a smaller amount of room to place your concrete. Is it more likely to break? 
A lot of times it will. If it's pushed closer together, um, it can. It just, it depends on what you're doing. And so we'll talk about in hot and uh, cold weather concrete, about when you need to try to push, push it so that it's a faster set or a slower set. Um, so if you're in hot weather, you know, you may want to slow down the curve a little bit. You know, this may be a normal curve, but in hot weather, it actually speeds up that curve. So it may look something more like that in the hot weather. So you may want to add ice. You may want to add chill water to get back to this normal curve. Um, in winter time, your curve, you know, if you're actually on the job site, you're measuring the temperature over time, it may look something like that. And you, what, you're, what you really want to do is you want to have some type of normal curve for normal placement. You don't want to be out there for 24 hours, you know, waiting for the concrete to harden. You want it to have a little more of a normal set. So you may add hot water. You may add, um, uh, you may add a little bit more cement or type three cement. Uh, you may add an accelerator. I've never seen that. I've, I've only seen where they put like the the tarp over it, and then they put like heater when it's really cold, and when it's really hot, yep. it, it, it water them down on on the top and put them on. Yep, that's uh, that's usually for the curing part. So if it's if it's already done finishing, they'll they'll throw um, they'll put they'll put stuff on there for curing to keep it from not getting too hot or not getting too cold. Make sure the moisture is kept in during the, the, the summer. Um, they also have it where um, during the winter they have uh, or summer they actually throw a tarp on there even after even before it's not really finished all the way, just to kind of help um, make sure that things aren't going to crack, things are setting up properly. So they'll go through that. So again, in hot and cold weather concrete. We'll talk a lot more about when to do some of those practices, uh, when, the, when the best way to do it. So uh, it just depends on what your circumstances are, what your application. If it's a floor slab where you have a lot of surface area, that's one thing. But if you're in a wall where you have forms that are actually um, protecting it, that's going to be different. Um, you know, so there's not enough surface area. That's actually being exposed to the environment. Um, these double humps. So this one's a little bit more normal. This may actually be a C3A kickoff that kicks off a little late. Um, so you may not have as as good of setting up up initially because only your CSH or your C3A C3 C3S is actually reacting here. And the C3A is being later, it's not reacting as well. So, you know, you can kind of see that and figure out if maybe you have materials that are going to um, not produce that. So, you may get a better, better strengths and better reaction from that and better timing. Um, also, with like a double hump that's at the back end, sometimes if you're using an accelerator, you'll see this too, especially if it's uh, um, uh, not. It's, if it's focused not on the C3A, um, you'll kind of see that react a little bit slower. So um, just kind of be aware. Do you get those from like your samples that you take before the whole concrete, or where do you get those from? So you can measure. So yesterday I showed you how you can use a little, like a little thermometer, to put in the concrete just to measure the initial fresh properties. What you do to measure a heat curve, which which well, we'll get a lot more into um, when we talk about quality control and testing and stuff, but um, you can actually take a maturity meter. So it's like uh, measuring the temperature over time. And you can stick, you can stick a, uh, in essence, a thermometer and measure inside the internal concrete over time and you can get a readout. And that readout, you can actually um, produce these curves. So what's, what's really cool is you can actually take a cylinder now. So you make a four by eight cylinder, and you can actually put it in a uh, box 
and that and it'll actually measure this heat curve for you and it's a lot easier than some of the other practices i used to have where you stick wires in the concrete and um, you can also have little sensors you can stick in the concrete or even in a cylinder and you can measure the heat that's given off so do what they're just like a like you just leave the sensors in there? Yeah, they're about $30. Yeah, yeah. And you can just leave them in there. And uh, they're, the battery will last, you know, as long as, as long as, you know, they'll last um, three months or whatever. And so they'll be just fine for what you're doing. And so a lot of times you'll actually take, um, you can actually take and break the con this concrete cylinder too if you want to know the strength over time of, of heat. To get maturity and we'll talk more um the next next uh exam about that uh, material but i just want people to kind of be aware of how powerful these heat curves are and how well things react because um no matter where you know if you ever deal with concrete i don't care if you're a material supplier if you're the guy providing the concrete if you're the person that's the con uh, concrete contractor that's trying to finish it or if you're the project manager trying to figure out how to how to put time schedules together, um, it's it's important to kind of understand the mechanism of how this works. So whenever people are saying, "Do we need to, to add hot water and do we need to add an accelerator? You know, maybe some calcium?" Uh, you'll kind of know. And we'll talk about what you know what I just said about the chemical admixtures next time, and how that kind of affects it. So. Um, with that, if you have any questions, if not, um, have a great rest of your week. So when this like did, I guess, I guess it's crazy, like, um, is there a different thickness of the component slab or something, it's like a different thickness, like one, you know, this big and the other one like this big. Yep. You know, it's going to set a different weight. Yep. If you've got a bigger slab, you cool down this side so it doesn't, is it, if it's thicker or not, not thick, it can set faster. Yeah, so we have a mass pour. Um, I put put together a mass pour presentation that we'll talk about in, in uh, the fourth oh, okay. um, period. But yeah, if you're if like we pour dams that are huge mm -hmm. um, or you have big foundations, yeah. um, you're going to the middle of your slab is going to be a lot hotter than the outside. So you have to be really careful. A lot of times you have to keep your formwork in. You have to put insulation in there. Um, you also have to be real careful. You may actually want to put ice. You may want to put other things in the concrete because that initial temperature is really key because um, sometimes the initial temperature uh, will really change how much it reacts to. Mm -hmm. So like, like I said, if it's hotter outside, if it's cooler outside, you may not get the the, the reaction um, to get the, that curve to go up. It may be actually wider here where it reacts at a longer period. And so that's the difference between like a, a accelerator or a retarder and a uh, hydration stabilizer. A hydration stabilizer will change this. A retarder actually changes this curve here so you can actually get a wider so and we'll talk about accelerators and tartars next period so uh, that confused you but yeah when you put the ice in there um is that during the mixing part of it or is it yeah, yeah so you replace a certain amount of your mixing water your design water weight with ice so you don't do more than 50 percent or you're going to have a lot of workability issues but yeah, you put ice, you can put ice, a certain amount of pounds of ice in there to um, try to help cool down initially the concrete. And you want that ice to, to, to kind of be melted by the time you get to the job site to place it. You don't yeah, want that's to, what I'm gonna ask. Just go with ice whenever you're pouring it. Okay, yeah, that can like, cause problems. Yeah, so that's why with the mass pours, you have to do it like all at once. Because yeah, you just like take a break and then come back and then, you know. For the rest, because you can't do it all in one day, you know. I've just seen a lot of construction sites and like.